All right, I am going to start live. I think we're live streaming. Um, um, once we're doing for a really long time. And so it is a gift today to be acting <laughs> alongside her. Um, anyway, I am gonna go and we're gonna fucking do it. All right, I am going to start live. I think we're live streaming. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> And so it is a gift today to be acting alongside her. All right, I am going to start live. We're is that my hold up. Is that my computer? I think we're live streaming. Whose computer is doing that? It might be mine. It might be someone else's. All right, I am going to start live. Is that my hold up. I think everyone needs to turn their volume off unless it's just their computer. Yeah, someone. Someone has it open. I think it, yeah, right. It's, I think Pauline, once we got yours, do you got it? Can you hear us though? All right. Um, we're, we're live, <laughs> by the way, everyone. Um, <laughs> um, there we go. I, that was, that was a hundred percent. Um, we're also waiting on Lauren and I, I hope she, everything's okay with her finding the link. Oh, I'm still on live on Instagram too. <laughs> Everything's goofy okay. right now. All right. So, um, let me see. I'm going to go ahead and see if Lauren get anything from her. No, maybe she's going to be joining in a minute and that's okay. Um, Alyssa, can I have you ready to le read mustard seed just in case anything is yeah. wrong connection? Thank you. Um, sure. Officially, I'm going to go ahead and start talking about the charity to everyone who's out there. Um, my name is Brando Crawford, and uh, three months ago, four months ago, what, what month are we in? Uh, in Mar end of March, um, I was uh, sitting moping around, feeling sorry for myself, and realized that this pandemic was not actually about me. Um, as many of you probably experienced as well, um, and I was having a little bit of like a, a panic attack and um, started thinking a little bit deeper about the world and realized I'm actually living in a time and a space, here's Lauren, good, excellent, where, where we can make impact. And I am not going to get sick, but there's some other people who are in a much worse position, people who depend on their salaries, who are gonna go to work and accidentally, you know, there's so many different scenarios that can go wrong for people. And uh, so what I wanted to see was if there was a way for me to raise money for um, two purposes. Uh, hospital in Chicago that serves low-income communities that are disproportionately affected um, by COVID-19 cases. Specifically, we found Mount Sinai Hospital in Chicago needed funds. Um, there's in such desperate need of funds that, you know, I know that it doesn't just go to their care. Sometimes we're even feeding families who um, are uh, in the hospital affected by the pandemic so badly that they can't even afford a meal. Um, so know that um, that cause is very important. That's 50% of the funds and the other 50% goes towards our initial cause, which was arts education. Um, we're living at a time right now where um, arts education and arts programs, you know, even before the pandemic, they're always the first thing to get cut. So imagine now at a time where every location, every school has been uh, affected um, and their funds and their fundraising, pro you know, basically they don't have money. So they're gonna cut their arts programs and we decided to support the Entertainment Industry Foundation, which uh, in turn funds these programs in place of the government and fights in Washington on behalf of uh, arts funding um, to hopefully prioritize it during a time where it loses priority. Um, so with all that being said, please, 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 everyone who's watching right now, this is a great opportunity to go and pay, pay a ticket price, pay any price, um, anything that you can. This is a free presentation. 
Um, and uh, you know, anything that you guys give will go towards 50% towards one organization, 50% to the other. We're all volunteers, even myself. Um, so every single cent goes towards the causes that are affected. Um, with all that being said, uh, today we are presenting William Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, one of my personal favorites, and it is our last play read. We've done 12. Each cast has been unbelievable. Um, if you go back, uh, our first ever play read, The Importance of Being Earnest, featured Alex Wolf, Ali Cravalho, Florin, um, and Justice Smith. Our second one featured Florence Pugh and, uh, and two of the cast members from the initial one. Our third read, we did the Gender Flipped Hamlet. They're all available online for viewing, actingforacause.org, or search Acting for a Cause on YouTube, and make a donation for those as well. Um, the donation link will stay up. This is our very last announced live read. Um, and so it is really meaningful to me. I'm very kind of emotional about it. I'm so, so grateful to our guests and, uh, and our actors. And I cannot wait, cannot wait uh, to present this to you all. Um, so with all that being said, I am going to check in with our actors who are all here right now. Um, is everyone ready? Any objections, any comments, any add-ons to this? Y'all are amazing. All right. Um, so without further ado, Acting for a Cause presents A Midsummer Night's Dream by William Shakespeare. Now, fair Hippolyta, our nuptial hour draws on apace. Four happy days brings in another moon, but oh, methinks how slow this old moon wanes. She lingers my desires like to a step day more dowager, long withering out a young man's revenue. Four days will quickly steep themselves in night. Four nights will quickly drain away the time. And then the moon, like to a silver bow, now bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword and won thy love doing the injuries, but I will wed thee in another key, with pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. Happy be, Theseus, our renowned duke. Thanks, good Aegeus. What's the news with thee? Full of vexation come I with complaint against my child, my daughter Hermia. My noble lord, Demetrius hath my consent to marry her. Stand forth, Lysander, and my gracious duke, this hath bewitched the bosom of my child. Thou, thou, Lysander, thou hast given her rhymes and interchanged love tokens with my child. Thou hast by moonlight at her window sung with feigning voices, verses of feigning love, and stolen the impression of her fantasy with messengers of strong prevailment and unhardened youth. With cunning hast thou filched my daughter's heart, turned her obedience, which is due to me, to stubborn harshness and my gracious duke. Be it so, she will not hear before your grace consent to marry with Demetrius. I beg, the ancient privilege of Athens, as she is mine, I may dispose of her, which shall be either to Demetrius or to her death, according to our law immediately provided in that case. What say you, Hermia? Be advised, fair maid, to you your father should be as a god, one that composed your beauties, and one to whom you are but as a form of wax, by him imprinted and within his power to leave the figure or disfigure it, Demetrius is a worthy gentleman. So is Lysander. <laughs> in himself he is, but in this kind, wanting your father's voice, the other must be held the worthier. I would my father looked but with my eyes. Rather, your eyes must with his judgment look. I do entreat your grace to pardon me. I know not by what power I am made bold, nor how it may concern my modesty in such a presence here to plead my thoughts, but I beseech your grace that I may know the worst that may befall me in this case if I refuse to wed Demetrius. Either to die the death or to abjure forever the society of men. Therefore, fair Hermia, question your desires, know of your youth, examine well your blood, whether if you yield not to your father's choice, you can endure the livery of a nun. For I to be in shady cloister mew, to live a barren sister all your life, chanting fate hymns to the cold fruitless moon, thrice blessed they that master so their blood to undergo such maiden pilgrimage. But earthlier happy is the rose distilled than that which withering on the virgin thorn grows, lives, and dies in a single blessedness. 
So I will grow, so live, so die, my Lord, ere I will yield my virgin Peyton up unto his lordship, whose unwished yoke my soul consents not to give sovereignty. Take time to pause, and by the next new moon, the sealing day betwixt my love and me for everlasting bond of fellowship, upon that day either prepare to die for disobedience to your father's will, or else to wed Demetrius as he would, or on Diana's altar to protest for I austerity and single life. I am, my lord, as well derived as he. As well possessed, my love is more than his. My fortunes every way as fairly ranked, if not with vantage as Demetrius's. And, which is more than all these boasts can be, I am beloved of Butus Hermia. Why should not I then prosecute my right? Demetrius, I'll avouch it to his head, made love to Nadar's daughter Helena, and won her soul. And she, sweet lady, dotes, devoutly dotes, dotes in idolatry, upon this spotted and inconstant man. I must confess that I have heard so much, and with Demetrius' thoughts I have spoken thereof, but being overall of self-affairs, my mind did lose it. But come, Aegeus, you shall go with me. I have some private schooling for you. For you, fair Hermia, look you arm yourself to fit your fancies to your father's will, or else the law of Athens yields you up, which by no means we may accentuate, to death or to a vow of single life. Come, my Hippolyta, what cheer, my love? Aegeus, go along. I must employ you in some business against our nuptial and confer you with of something nearly that concerns yourselves. With duty and desire, I follow you. <sighs> How now, my love? Why is your cheek so pale? How chance the roses there do fade so fast? Be like for want of rain, which I could well beteem them from the tempest of my eyes. Amy, me, for aught that I could ever read. Could ever hear by tale or history, the course of true love never did run smooth, but either it was different in blood. Or oh, cross, too high to be enthralled too low. Or else misgraft in respect of years. Or oh, spite, too old to be engaged to young. Or merit stood upon the choice of friends. Oh hell, to choose love by another's eyes. Or if there were a sympathy in choice, war, death, or sickness did lay siege to it, making it momentany as a sound. Swift as a shadow, short as any dream, brief as the lightning in the coiled night, that in a spleen unfolds both heaven and earth, and ere a man hath power to say, behold, the jaws of darkness do devour it up, so quick bright things come to confusion. If then true lovers have been ever crossed, it stands as an edict in destiny. Then let us teach our trial patience, because it is a customary cross, as due to love as thoughts and dreams and sighs, wishes and tears, poor fancy's followers. A good persuasion. Therefore, hear me, Hermia. I have a widow aunt, a dowager, of great revenue, and she hath no child. From Athens is her house remote seven leagues, and she respects me as her only son. There, gentle Hermia, may I marry thee. And to that place the sharp Athenian law cannot pursue us. If thou lovest me, then steal forth thy father's house tomorrow night, and in the word, a league without the town, where I did meet thee once with Helena to do observance to a morn of May. There I will stay for thee. My good Lysander, I swear to thee by Cupid's strongest bow, by his best arrow with the golden head, by the simplicity of Venus's doves, by that which knitteth souls and prospers loves, and by that fire which burned the Carthage queen when the false Trojan under sail was seen, by all the vows that ever men have broke in number more than ever women spoke, in that same place thou hast appointed me, tomorrow truly will I meet with thee. Keep promise, love. Look, here comes Helena. Godspeed, fair Helena, wither away. Call oh, you me fair? That fair again unsay, Demetrius loves your fair. Oh, happy fair. Your eyes are load stars and your tongue sweet air, more tunable than lark to shepherd's ear when wheat is green, when hawthorn buds appear. Sickness is catching, oh, were favors so, yours would I catch for Hermia. Ere I go, my ear should catch your voice, my eye, your eye, my tongue should catch your tongue, sweet melody. Were the world mine, Demetrius being baited, the rest I'll give to you to be translated. Oh, teach me how you look and with what art you sway the motion of Demetrius's heart. I frown upon him, yet he loves me still. Oh, that your frowns would teach my smile such skill. 
I give him curses, yet he gives me love. No, that my prayers could such affection move. The more I hate, the more he follows me. The more I love, the more he hateth me. His folly, Helena, is no fault of mine. None but your beauty. Would that fault were mine? <gasps> Take comfort. He no more shall see my face. Lysander and myself will fly this place. Before the time I did Lysander see seemed Athens as a paradise to me. Oh, then what graces in my love do dwell that he hath turned a heaven unto a hell. Helen, to you our minds we will unfold. Tomorrow night when Phoebe doth behold her silver visage in the watery glass, decking with liquid pearl the bladed grass, a time that lover's flights doth still conceal. All through Athens' dates have we devised to steal. And in that wood where often you and I upon faint primrose beds were wont to lie, emptying our bosoms of their counsel sweet, there my Lysander and myself shall meet, and thence from Athens turn away our eyes to see new friends and stranger companies. Farewell, sweet playfellow, pray thou for us, and good luck grant thee thy Demetrius. Keep word, Lysander, we must starve our sight from lovers' food till morrow deep midnight. I will, my Hermia. Hermia. Helena, adieu. Helena, adieu, as you on him, Demetrius, dote on you. Lysander exits. Oh, how happy some or other can some can be. Through Athens, I am thought as fair as she. But what of that? Demetrius thinks not so. He will not know what all but he do know. And he errs, doting on Hermia's eyes, so I admiring of his qualities. For ere Demetrius looked on Hermia's eye, he hailed down oaths that he was only mine. And when his hail some heat from Hermia felt, so he dissolved and show, shores of oaths did melt. I will go tell Hermia uh, I will go tell him of fair Hermia's flight. Then to the wood will he tomorrow night pursue her. And for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense. But herein mean I to enrich my pain that he have his sight thither back and again. Helena exits. Enter snug the joiner, bottom the weaver, and flute the bellows mender, and snout the tinker, and startling the tailor, followed by Puck. What hemp and homespuns have we swagger in here, so near the cradle of the fairy queen? What a play tour! I'll be an auditor, an actor too, perhaps, if I see cause. <clears throat> Is all our company here? You were best to call them, general, man by man, according to the script. Well, here is the scroll of every man's name, which is thought fit through all of Athens to play in our interlude before the Duke and the Duchess on his wedding day at night. First, good Peter Quince, say what the play treats on, then read the names of the actors and so grow to a point. Mary, our play is the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. A good piece of work, I assure you, Anna Mary. Now, good Peter Quince, call forth your actors by the scroll. Masters, spread yourselves. <clears throat> and sir, as I call you, Nick Bottom the Weaver. Ready. Name what part I am for and proceed. You, Nick Bottom, are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus? A lover, a tyrant, a lover that kills himself, most gallant for love. Hmm, that will ask some tears in the true performing of it. If I do it, let the audience look to their eyes. I will move storms, I will condole in some measure to the rest. Yet my chief humor is for a tyrant. I could play Ericles rarely, or a part to tear a cat in, to make all split. <clears throat> the raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates. Amphibious's car shall shine from far and make and mar the foolish fates. <clears throat> <clears throat> This was lofty. Uh, 
Now, name the rest of the players. Um, this is Eracles' vein, a tyrant's vein. A lover is more condoling. Uh, <clears throat> Francis Flute, the bellows mender. Here, Peter Quint. Flute, you must take Thisbe on you. What is Thisbe? A wandering knight? Oh, it is the lady that Pyramus must love. Oh, my faith, let me, let not me play a woman. I have a beard coming. Saw one. You shall play it in a mask, and you may speak as small as you will. And I may hide my face. Let me play Thisbe too. <clears throat> I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. Thisney, This, Thisney. Ah, Pyramus, my lover dear. Thy Thisbe dear, my lady dear. No, 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 you must play Pyramus, and flute you Thisbe. Well, proceed. Uh, Robin Starveling, the, the tailor. Here, Peter Quince. Robin Starveling, you must play Thisbe's mother. Tom Snout, the tinker. Here, Peter Quince. You, Pyramus' father. Myself, Thisbe's father. Uh, snug, Snug, the joiner. You, Lion's part. And I hope here is a play fitted. The Lion part's written. Pray you, if it be, give it to me, for I am slow of study. Well, you may do it extempore, for it is nothing but roaring. Let me play the lion too. I will roar that I will any man's heart good to hear me. I will roar that I may make the duke say, let him roar again. Let him roar again. And you should do it terribly. You would fright the duchess and the ladies that they would shriek. And that were enough to hang us all. That would hang us. Everybody yeah, would I, I, I grant you, friends, if you should fright the ladies out of their wits, that they would have no more discretion but to hang us, but I will aggravate my voice so that I will roar you as gently as any suckling dove. I will roar you twere any nightingale. You can play no part but Pyramus, for Pyramus is a sweet-faced man, a proper man as one shall see in a summer's day, a most lovely gentleman-like man, okay? Therefore, you must needs play Pyramus. Well, I, I will undertake it. What beard were I best to play it in? Uh, why, what you will. Oh, I will discharge it in either your straw-colored beard or your orange tawny beard, your purple ingrain beard, or, or your French crown-colored beard, your perfect yellow. Some of your French crowns have no hair at all, and then you will play barefaced. But masters, here are your parts. And I am to entreat you, request you, and desire you to con them by tomorrow night and meet me in the palace wood a mile without the town by moonlight. There we will rehearse, for if we meet in the city, we shall be dog with company and our devices known. In the meantime, I will draw a bill of properties such as our play wants. I pray you not fail me. We will meet, and there we may rehearse most obscenely and courageously. Take pains, be perfect. Adieu. At the Duke's Oak we meet. Enough. Hold or cut bowstrings. They all exit except for uh, Mustard Seed and Puck. And our spirit, whither wander you? Over hill, over dale, thorough a bush, thorough a grail. Mm. Over park, over pale, thorough a flood, thorough a fire. I do wander everywhere, swifter than the moon sphere. And I serve the fairy queen, mm. to dew her orbs upon the green, the cowslips tall her pensioners be, in their gold coats spot you see. Those be rubies, fairy favours, in those freckles live their savours. I must go seek some dewdrops here, and had a pearl in every cowslip's ear. Farewell, their lob of spirits, I'll be gone. Our queen and all her elves, come here anon. Mm, the king doth keep his revels here tonight. Take heed the king come not within his sight. For Oberon is passing fell and wrath, because that she, as her attendant, hath a lovely boy stolen from an Indian king. She never had so sweet a changeling. And jealous Oberon would have the child knight of his train to trace the forest wild. But she, perforce, withholds the loved boy, crowns him with flowers and makes him all his joy. Either I mistake your shape and make him quiet, 
or else you are that shrewd and navish sprite called Robin Goodfellow. Are you not he that frights the maidens of the villager, skim milk and sometimes labour of the quern, and bootless make the breathless housewife churn, and sometimes make the drink no bear to barn, mislead night wanderers laughing to their harm? Those that hobgoblin call you, and sweet puck, you do their work, and they shall have good luck. Are you not he? Thou speakest all right. I am that merry wanderer of the night. I jest to Oberon and make him smile. <laughs> when I have fat and bean ford, bean fed horse beguile, neighing in the likeness of a filly foal. And sometimes I lurk in a gossip's bowl in very likeness of a roasted crab. And when she drinks against her lips, I bob and on her withered dewlap pour the ale. <laughs> And the wisest aunt telling the saddest tale, sometime for three foot stool mistaketh me, then slip I from her bum, down topple she, and Taylor cries and falls into a cough. And then the whole choir hold their hips and laugh, and waxen in their mirth and knees and swear a merrier hour was never wasted there. But room, fairy, here comes Oberon. And here my mistress would that he were wrong. Enter Oberon, the King of Fairies, and Queen Titania. I'll met by moonlight, proud Titania. What, jealous Oberon? I have forsworn his bed and company. Terry, rash wanton, am I not thy lord? Then I must be thy lady. But I know when thou hast stolen away from fairyland, and in the shape of corn sat all day, playing on pipes of corn and bursting love to amorous Phyllida, why art thou here? Come from the farthest steep of India, but that, forsooth, forsooth, the bouncing Amazon, your busky mistress and your warrior love, to Theseus must be wedded, and you come to give their bed joy and prosperity. How canst thou thus for shame, Titania, glance at my credit with Hippolyta, knowing I know thy love to Theseus? Hmm? Didst thou not lead him through the glimmering light from Perigenia? whom he ravished and make him with fair Aeglis break his faith with Ariadne and Antiopa? These are the forgeries of jealousy. And never since the middle summer spring met we on a hill in dale, forest, or mead, by paved fountain or by rushy brook, or in the beached margin of the sea, to dance our ringlets to the whistling wind. But with thy brows thou hast disturbed our sport. The spring, the summer, the childing autumn, angry winter change, their wanted libraries, and the mazed world, by their increase, now knows not which is which. And this same progeny of evils comes with from our debate, from our dissension. We are their parents and original. Do you amend it then? It lies in you. Why should Titania cross her Oberon? I do but beg a little changeling boy to be my henchman. Set your heart at rest. The fairyland buys not the child of me. His mother was a votress of my order, and in the spiced Indian air, by night, full often hath she gossiped by my side and sat with me on Neptune's yellow sands, marking them bark traders on the flood, when we have laughed to see the sails conceive and grow big bellied with the wanton wind, which she, with pretty and with swimming gait, following her womb, then rich with my young squire, would imitate and sail upon the land to fetch me trifles and return again as from a voyage rich with merchandise. But she, being mortal, of that boy did die. And for her sake do I rear up her boy. And for her sake, I will not part with him. How long within this wood intend you stay? Perchance till after Theseus' wedding day. If you will patiently dance in our round and see our moonlight revels, go with us. If not, shun me and I will spare your haunts. Give me that boy and I will go with thee. Not for thy fairy kingdom. Fairies away, we shall chide down right if I longer stay. Well, go, exit. Thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. My gentle puck, come hither. Thou rememberest since once I sat upon a promontory and heard a mermaid on a dolphin's back uttering such dulcet and harmonious breath that the rude sea grew civil at her song and certain stars shot madly from their spheres to hear the sea maid's music? I remember. That very time, 
I saw, but thou couldst not, flying between the cold moon and the earth, Cupid, all armed, a certain aim he took at a fair vestal thrown by the west, and loosed his love shaft smartly from his bow, and it should pierce a hundred thousand hearts. But I might see Cupid's fiery shaft quenched in the chast beams of the watery moon, and the imperial votress passed on in maiden's meditation fancy free, yet marked where the bolt of Cupid fell. It fell upon a little western flower, before milk white, now purple with love's wound, and maidens call it love in idleness. Fetch me that flower, the herb I showed thee once, the juice of it on sleeping eyelids laid will make man or woman madly dote upon the next live creature that it sees. Fetch me this herb and be thou here again ere the Leviathan can swim a league. Go. I'll put a girdle around the earth in 40 minutes. Up exits. Having once this juice, I'll watch Titania when she sleeps and drop the liquor of it in her eyes. The next thing she, which she waking looks upon, she shall pursue it with the soul of love. And ere I take this charm from off her sight, as I can take it with another herb, I'll make her render up her page to me. But who comes here? I am invisible and I will overhear their conference. Enter Demetrius and Helena. Oh, I love thee not, therefore pursue me not. Where is Lysander and fair Hermia? The one I'll slay, the other slayeth me. Thou toldst me they were stolen to this wood. And here I am and wood within this wood because I cannot meet my Hermia. Hence, get thee gone and follow me no more. You draw me, you hard-hearted adamant. But yet you draw not iron for my heart is true as steel. Leave you your power to draw and I shall have no power to follow you. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair, or rather do I not in plainest truth tell you I do not, or nor I cannot love you? And even for that, do I love you the more. I am your spaniel, and Demetrius, the more you beat me, I will fawn on you. Use me, but not as your spaniel. Spurn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me, only give me leave, unworthy as I am to follow you. But a worser, worser place can I beg in your love, and yet a place of high respect with me, than to be used as your dog. Tempt not too much the hatred of my spirit, for I am sick when I do look on thee. And I am sick when I look not on you. You do impeach your modesty too much to lead the city and commit yourself into the hands of one that loves you not. To trust the opportunity of night and the ill counsel of a desert place with the rich worth of your virginity. Your virtue is my privilege. For that it is not night when I do see your face. Therefore I think I am not in the night, nor doth this wood lack worlds of company. For you in my respect are all the world. Then how can it be said I am alone when all the world is here to look on me? I'll run from thee and hide me in the bricks and lead thee to the mercy of wild beasts. The wildest hath not such a heart as you. Run when you will, the story shall be changed. Apollo flies and Daphne holds the chase. The dove, dove, dove pursues the griffin. The mild hind makes speed to, the, to catch the tiger. Bootless speed, when cowardice pursues and valor flies. I will not stay thy questions, let me go. Or if thou follow me, do not believe, but I shall do thee mischief in the wood. Hey, in the temple, in the town, the field, you do me mischief. Fine, Demetrius, your wrongs do set a scandal on my sex. We cannot fight for love as men may do. We should be wooed. We are not made to woo. Demetrius exits. I'll follow thee and make a heaven of hell to die upon the hand I love so well. Helena exits. Fare thee well, nymph. Ere he do leave this grove, thou shalt fly him, and he shall seek thy love. Puck enters. Hast thou the flower there? Welcome, wanderer. Aye, there it is. I pray thee, give it to me. I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where the ox lips and the nodding violet grows, quiet over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses and with eglantine. There sleeps Titania some time of the night lulled in these flowers with dancing and delight. And there the snake throws her enameled skin, weed wide enough to wrap a fairy in. And with the juice of this, I'll streak her eyes and make her full of hateful fantasies. Puck, 
Take thou some of it and seek through this grove. A sweet Athenian lady is in love with a disdainful youth. Anoint his eyes, but do it when the next thing he spies may be the lady. Thou shalt know the man by the Athenian garments he hath on. Affect it with some care that he may prove more fond on her than she upon her love. And look, thou meet me here at the first cock crow. Fear not, my lord. The servant shall do so. They exit. Enter Titania, queen of fairies, with her train. Come, um, now around all in a fairy song. Then for the third part of a minute, hence, some to kill kangaroos and musgroves buds, some war with the remiss for their leathern wings, to make my small elves coats and some keep back and glamorous owl that nightly hoots and wonders at our quaint spirits. Sing me now sleep, then to your offices and let me rest. Hmm. Hence, away, now all is well. One aloof stands sentinel. The fairies exits, and Oberon comes on. What thou seest, when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love take. Love and languish for his sake, be it ounce or cat or bear, pard or boar with bristled hair, in thy eye that shall appear, when thou wakest, it is thy dear. Wake when some vile things near. Lysander and Hermia enter. Fair love, you faint with wandering in the wood. And to speak troth, I forgot our way. We'll rest us, Hermia, if you think it good, and tarry for the comfort of the day. Be it so, Lysander, find you out a bed, for I upon this bank will rest my head. Uh, one turf shall serve as pillow for us both. One heart, one bed, two bosoms, and one troth. Nay, good Lysander, for my sake, my dear, lie further off yet, do not lie so near. Oh, take the sense, sweet, of my innocence. Love takes the meaning in love's conference. I mean that my heart unto yours is knit, so that but one heart we can make of it. Two bosoms interchanged with an oath, so then two bosoms in a single drop. Then by your side I see no bedroom me deny, for lying so, Hermia, I, I do not lie. Lysander riddles very prettily. Now much beshrew my manners and my pride, if Hermia meant to say Lysander lied. But, gentle friend, for love and courtesy lie further off in human modesty. Such separation, as may well be said, becomes a virtuous bachelor and a maid. So far be distant, and good night, sweet friend, thy love ne'er alter till thy sweet love end. Amen, amen to that fair prayer, say I, and then end life when I end loyalty. Here is my bed. Sleep give thee all his rest. With half that wish, the wisher's eyes sleep. He sleep. Forest I have gone, but Athenia found I none on whose eyes I might approve this flower's force and stirring love. Right in silence? Who is here? The Athens he doth wear. This is he, my master said, despised the Athenian maid. Here's me. Sleeping sound, dank and dirty crown, pretty soul she durst not lie near this lack love, this kill courtesy. Churro, upon the eyes I throw all the power this charm doth. Oh! Hmm. And now they just I love her. Sleep, sleep on my eyelid. So wake when I die, I must now go. Over all. Enter Demetrius and Helena. Stay, though thou kill me, sweet Demetrius. I charge thee hence, and do not haunt me thus. Oh, wilt thou, darkling, leave me? Do not so. Stay on thy peril, I alone will go. He exits. <sighs> I am out of breath in this fond chase. The more my prayer, the lesser is my grace. Happy is Hermia, wheresoe'er she lies, for she hath blessed and attractive eyes. How came her eyes so bright? Not with salt tears. If so, my eyes are oftener washed than hers. No, no, I am as ugly as a bear, for beasts that meet me run away for fear. Therefore, no marvel through Demetrius, do as a monster fly my presence thus. What wicked and dissembling glass of mine made me compare with Hermia's fiery eye? But who is here? Bysender on the ground? Dead or asleep? I see no blood, no wound. Lysander, if you live, good sir, awake. 
and run through fire I will for thy sweet sake. Transparent Helena, nature shows art that through thy bosom makes me see thy heart. Where is Demetrius? Oh, how fit a word is that vile name to perish on my sword. Do not say so, Lysander, say not so. What though, he loves your Hermia? Lord, what though? Yet Hermia still loves you, then be content. <laughs> content with Hermia? No, I do repent. The tedious minutes I with her have spent, not Hermia, but Helena I love. Who will not change a raven for a dove? The will of man is by his reason swayed, and reason says you are the worthier maid. Things growing are not ripe until their season, so I being young, till now ripe not to reason. And touching now the point of human skill, reason becomes the marshal to my will, and leads me to your eyes where I overlook, Love's stories written in love's richest books. <laughs> Wherefore was I to this keen mockery born? When at your hands did I deserve the scorn? Is it not enough? Is it not enough, young man, that I did never, no, nor never can deserve a sweet look from Demetrius's eye? But you must flout my insufficiency? Good troth, you do me wrong. Good sooth, you do. In such disdainful manner, me to woo. But fare you well. Perforce, I must confess, I thought you, Lord, of more true gentleness. Oh, that a lady of one man refused should be another, therefore be abused. He exits. She sees not Hermia. Hermia, sleep thou there, and never mayest thou come Lysander near. For as surfeit are the sweetest things, the deepest loathing to the stomach brings, or as the heresies that men do leave are hated most of those they did deceive. So thou, my surfeit and my heresy, of all be hated, but the most of me. And all my powers address your love and might to honor Helen and to be her knight. He exits. Help me, Lysander, help me. Do thy best to pluck this crawling serpent from my breast. I, me, for pity. What a dream was here. Lysander, look how I do quake. With fear, me thought a serpent eat my heart away, and you sat smiling at his cruel prey. Lysander? What removed? Lysander, Lord, what out of hearing gone? No sound, no word? Alack, where are you? Speak, and if you hear speak of all loves, I swoon almost with fear. No, then I well perceive you are not nigh, either death or you I'll find immediately. He exits and enter the clowns, quince, snug, bottom, flute, snout, and startling. Are we all met? And here's a marvelous convenient place for our rehearsal. Uh, the green plot shall be our stage. This Hawthorne break our tiring house and we will do it in action as we will do it before the Duke. Uh, Peter Quinns. What sayest thou, Bully Bottom? There are things in this comedy of Pyramus and Thisbe that will never please. First, Pyramus must draw a sword to kill himself which the ladies cannot abide. How answer you that? Fire like in a parlous fear. I believe we must leave the killing out when all is done. Not a wit. I have a device to make you all well. Write me a prologue and let the prologue seem to say, we will do no harm with our swords and that Pyramus is not killed indeed. And for the more better assurance, tell them that I, Pyramus, am not Pyramus, but Bottom, the weaver. This will put them out of fear. Well, we, we will have such a prologue, and it shall be written in eight and six. No, make it two more. Let it be written in eight and eight. Will not the ladies be afeard of the lion? I fear it, I promise you. Masters, you ought to consider with yourselves to bring in, God shield us, a lion among ladies is the most dreadful thing. For there is not a more fearful wildfowl than your lion living, and we ought to look to it. Therefore, another prologue must tell that he is not a lion. Nay, you must name his name, and half of his face must be seen through the lion's neck. And he must speak through, saying thus, or to the same defect, ladies, or, or, or fair ladies, I would wish you, or request you, or 
I would entreat you not to fear or tremble. My life for yours. If you think I come hither as a lion, it were pity of my life. No, I am no such thing. I am a man as other men are. And there indeed, let him name his name and tell them plainly, he is snug, the joiner. Well, it, it shall be so. But there is two hard things, that is, to bring the moonlight into a chamber, for you know Pyramus and this be meet by moonlight. Well, doth the moon shine that night that we play our play? A, a calendar, a calendar. Look in the almanac. Find out the moonshine. Find out the moonshine. Oh, uh, yes, yes, it doth shine that night. Why, then you may... You leave a casement of the great chamber window where we play open, and and the moon may shine in the casement. Why? Or else one must come in with a bush of thorns and a lantern and, and say he comes to disfigure or to present the person of moonshine. Then there is another thing. We, we must have a wall in the great chamber, for Pyramus and Thisbe, says the story, did talk through the chink of a wall. You, you can never bring in a wall. What say you, Bottom? S uh, uh, some, some man or other must present wool, and let, let him have some plaster or some loam or some rough cast about him to signify a wall, and let him hold his fingers thus, and, and through that cranny shall Pyramus and Thisbe whisper. If that may be, then all is well. Okay, come. Sit down, every mother's son, and rehearse your parts. <clears throat> Pyramus, you begin. When you have spoken your speech, enter into that break, and so everyone according to his cue. Speak, Pyramus. Thisbe, stand forth. Uh, th th Thisbe, the flowers of odious, savors sweet. Odorous, odorous. Odors, savors sweet. So hath thy breath. And my dearest Thisbe, dear, um, but hark a voice, shall, shall thou but hear a while, and, and by and by I will appear to thee, appear. Ranger Pierre, must an air play here. Must I speak now? Aye, Mary, must you, for, for you must understand he goes but to see a noise that he heard and is to come again. Most radiant, Pyramus most lily-white of hue, of color like the red rose on triumphant briar, most bristly juvenile and eke most lovely Jew, as true as true as horse that yet never tire. I'll meet thee, Pyramus, at Ninny's tomb. Ninny's tomb. Why, you must not speak that yet. You must answer to Pyramus. You speak all your part at once, cues and all. Pyramus, enter. Your cue is passed. It is never tire. Oh. As true as true as horse, that yet never tire. If I were fair, Thisbe, I were only thine. Oh, monstrous. Oh, strange. We are haunted. Pray, masters, fly. Masters, help. The exit. I'll follow you. I'll lead you about around, through bog, through bush, through brake, through briar. Sometime a horse I'll be, sometimes a hound, a hog, a headless bear, sometime a fire. <laughs> and neigh, and back, and grunt, and roar, and burn, like horse, hound, hog, bear, fire at every turn. What? Why do they run away? This is a knavery of them to make me afraid. Oh, Bottom, thou art changed. Oh. What do I see on thee? What do you see? You see an asshead of your own, do you? Bless thee, bottom, bless thee, thou art translated. Ah, I see their knavery. This is to make an ass of me, to frighten me, if they could. But I will not stir from this place. Do what they can. I will walk up and down here, but I will sing that they shall hear, I am not afraid. 
Me, who's that so black of hue, with orange tony hill, the throstle with his notes so true? The wren, with his quiet quill. What angel wakes me from my flowery bed? The finch, the sparrow, <laughs> the lark, the plastic cuckoo gray, whose note fills so mad and the doth mark, <clears throat> and dares not answer nay. For who indeed, who would set his wish to sow a foolish bird? Who would give a bird to lie, though the cuckoo never sow? I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ear is much enamored of thy note. So is my eye enthralled to thy shape. And thy fair virtue's force perforce doth move me. On the first view to say, to swear, I love thee. Oh, methinks, mistress, you should have very little reason for that. <clears throat> Yet to say the truth, Reason and love keep little company together nowadays. The more pity that some honest neighbors will not make them friends, nay, I can gleek upon occasion. Thou art as wise as thou art beautiful. Oh, no, not so, neither. But if I had wit enough to get out of this wood, I have enough to serve mine own, then. Out of this wood do not desire to go. Thou shalt remain here, whether thou wilt or no. I am a spirit of no common rate. The summer still doth tend upon my state, and I do love thee. Therefore go with me. I'll give the fairies to attend on thee, and I will purge thy mortal grossness so that thou, thou, thou shalt like an airy spirit go. Peace blossom, cobweb, and mustard seed. The three fairies enter. Ready. And I. Die. Where shall we Where go? Where shall we go? Be kind and courteous to this gentleman. Hop in his walks and gamble in his eyes. Feed him with apricots and dewberries, with purple grapes, green figs and mulberries. The honey bags steal from the humble bees, and for night tapers crop their waxen thighs and light them at the fiery glowworm's eyes. To have my love to bed and to arise and pluck the wings from painted butterflies to fan the moonbeams from his sleeping eyes. Not to him, elves, and do him courtesies. <laughs> Hail, mortal. Hail. <laughs> I cry your worship's mercy heartily. I beseech your worship's name. Cobweb. I shall desire you of more acquaintance. Good Master Cobweb, if I cut my finger, I shall make bold with you. Your name, Auntess Gentlewoman? Peas Blossom. <laughs> oh, good, Master Peas Blossom. I shall desire of more acquaintance too. Your name, beseech you, sir. Mustard Seed. Oh, good Master Mustard Seed. <laughs> I know your patience well. That same cowardly, giant light ox, beef, hath devoured many a gentleman of your house. I promise you, your kindred hath made my eyes water ere now. I desire you of more acquaintance, good master mustard seed. Come wait upon him, lead him to my bower. The moon, methinks, looks with a watery eye, and when she weeps, weeps every little flower lamenting some enforced chastity. Tie up my lover's tongue, bring him silently. Kiana, bottom of the fairies exit. Enter Oberon. I wonder if Titania be awaked, then what it was that next came in her eye, which she must dote on extremity. Here comes my messenger. How now, mad spirit, what night rule now about this haunted grove? Mm, well, 
my mistress with a monster is in love, near to her close and consecrated bower while she was in her dull and sleeping hour. A crew of patches, rude mechanicals that work for bread upon Athenian stalls were met together to rehearse a play intended for great Theseus's nuptial day. <laughs> the shallowest thick skin of that barren sort who pure mispresented in their sport forsook his scene and entered in a break when I did him at this advantage take. An ass's knoll, I fixed on his head. <laughs> and now his fizz must be answered. And forth my mimic comes when they spy, as wild geese, the creeping fowler eye, or a russet padded coughs, many in sort, rising and cawing at the gun's report, sever themselves and madly sweep the sky. So at his sight, away his fellows fly. And at our stamp here, o'er and o'er one falls. He murder cries and help from Athens calls. I led them on in, in, this, in this distracted fear and left sweet pure mistranslated there. And in that moment, so it came to pass, Tatiana waked, straight away loved an ass. <laughs> this falls out better than I could devise, but Hast thou yet latched the Athenian eyes with the love juice as I did bid thee? I took him sleeping, that is finished too, and the Athenian woman by his side, that when he wakes, of force she must be eyed. Stand close. <clears throat> this is the same Athenian. Well, this is the woman, but not this the man. Oh, why rebuke you him that loves you so? Lay breath so bitter on your bitter foe. Now I but chide, but I should use thee worse, for thou, I fear, hast given me cause to curse. If thou hast slain Lysander in his sleep, being o'er shoes and blood, plunge in the deep, and kill me too. The sun was not so true unto the day as he to me. Would he have stolen away from sleeping Hermia? I'll believe as soon Please, her brother's new tide with antipodes. It cannot be, but thou hast murdered him. So should a murderer look so dead, so grim. So should the murder look, and so should I, pierced through the heart with your stern cruelty. Yet you, the murderer, look as bright, as clear as yonder Venus in her glimmering sphere. What's this to my Lysander? Where is he? Ah, good Demetrius, wilt thou give him me? I'd rather give his carcass to my hounds. Out, dog, out! Her, thou drives me past the bounds of maiden's patience. Hast thou slain him then? And hast thou killed him sleeping? Oh, brave touch, could not a worm and adder do so much? You spend your passion on misprized mood. I am not guilty of Lysander's blood, nor is he dead for aught that I can tell. I pray thee, tell me then that he is well. And if I could, what should I get there for? A privilege never to see me more, and from thy hated presence part I so. See me no more, whether he be dead or no. <sighs> there is no following her in this fierce vein. Here, therefore, a while I will remain. So sorrow's heaviness doth heavier grow, for debt that bankrupt sleep doth sorrow owe, which now in some slight measure it will pay. If for his tender, here I make some stay. Mm -hmm. Puck, what hast thou done? Thou hast mistaken quite and laid the love juice on some true love sight. Of thy misprison must perforce ensue some true love turned and not a false love turned true. Then fate o rules that one man holding troth. A million fail confounding oath on oath. Uh, about the wood, go swifter than the wind, and Helena of Athens, look thou find, all fancy sick she is, and pale of cheer, with sighs of love that cost the fresh blood dear. By some illusion, see thou bring her here, I'll charm his eyes against she do appear. I go, I go, look how I go, swifter than arrow from the Tartar's bow. Flower of this purple dye, hit with Cupid's archery, sink in apple of his eye. When his love he doth espy, let her shine as gloriously as the Venus of the sky. When thou wakest, if she be by, beg of her for remedy. Pop enters.
that are gone for me band. Helena is here at hand, and the youth mistook by me, pleading for a lover's fee. <laughs> Shall we their fond pageancy? Lord, what fools these mortals be. <laughs> Stand aside. The noise they make will cause Demetrius to awake. Mm. We'll chew it once we won. That must needs be sport alone. And those things do best please me that befall preposterously. Exit, Lysander and Helena enter. Why should you think that I woo in scorn? Scorn and derision never come in tears. Look, when I vow, I weep. And vow so born in their nativity, all truth appears. How can these things in me seem scorn to you, bearing the badge of faith to prove them true? You do advance your cunning more and more when truth kills truth. O oh, devilish holy fray. These vows are Hermia's. Will you give her o'er? Weigh oath with oath, and you will and you will nothing weigh. Your vows to her, her your vows to her and me put in two scales will ever weigh, and both as light as tails. I I had no judgment when I swore her. Nor none in my mind, now you give her o'er. Demetrius loves her, and he loves not you. <sighs> Oh, ho, ho, ho. Helen, goddess, nymph, perfect divine, to what my love shall I compare thine eye? Crystal is muddy. Oh, how ripe and show thy lips, those kissing cherries, tempting grow. Oh, let me kiss this princess of pure white, this seal of bliss. Oh, spite, oh, hell. I see you all are bent to set against me for your merriment. If you were civil and knew courtesy, you would not do me thus on much injury. Can you not hate me as I know you do, but you must join in souls to mock me too? If you were men as men you are in show, you would not use a gentle lady so to vow and swear and super praise my parts when I am sure you hate me with your hearts. You both are rivals and love Hermia and now both rivals to mock Helen. A trim exploit, a manly enterprise to conjure tears up in a poor maid's eyes with your derision. None of noble sort would so offend a virgin and extort a pole sword's patience all to make you sport. Yes, you are unkind, Demetrius. Be not so, for you love Hermia, this you know I know. And here with all good will, with all my heart, in Hermia's love I yield you up my part, and yours of Helena to me bequeath whom I do love and will do till my death. Never did mockers waste more idle breath. Lysander, keep thy Hermia, I will none. If e'er I loved her, all that love is gone, my heart to her, but as guest wise sojourned and now to Helen, it is my home returned there to remain. Helen, it is not so. Disparage not the faith thou dost not know, least to thy peril thou abide dear. Oh, look, where thy love comes, yonder it is thy dear. Hermia enters. Dark night, that from the eye his function takes, the ear more quick of apprehension makes, wherein it doth impair the seeing sense, it pays the hearing double recompense. Thou art not mine eye, Lysander, found. Mine ear, I think, it brought me to thy sound. But why unkindly didst thou leave me so? Well, why should he stay whom love doth press to go? What love could press Lysander from my side? Lysander's love, that would not let him bide. Fair Helena, who more engilds the night than all yon fiery o's and eyes of light, why seekest thou me? Could not this make thee know? The hate I bear thee made me leave thee so? You speak not as you think, it cannot be. Lo, she is one of this confederacy. Now I perceive they have conjoined all three to fashion this false sport in spite of me. Injurious Hermia, most ungrateful maid, have you conspired? Have you with these contrived to bait me with this foul derision? Is all the counsel that we two have shared, the sisters' vows, the hours that we have spent when we have chided the hasty-footed time for parting us, oh, is all forgot? All school days, friendship, childhood, innocence, we, Hermia, like two artificial gods, have with our needles created both one flower, both one sampler sitting on one cushion, both warbling of one song, both in one key, as if our hands, our sides, voices, and minds had been incorporate. 
So we grow together like a double cherry, seeming parted, but yet an union in partition. Two lovely berries molded on one stem. So with two seeming bodies, but one heart, two of the first, like coats in heraldry, do but to one and crowned with one crest. And will you rent our ancient love asunder to join with men in scorning your poor friend? Is it not friendly, tis not maidenly? Our sex, as well as I, may chide you for it, though I alone do feel the injury. I am amazed at your passionate words. I scorn you not. It seems that you scorn me. Have you not set Lysander as in scorn to follow me and praise my eyes and face? And made your other love, Demetrius, who even but now did spur me with his foot, to call me goddess, nymph, divine, and rare, precious, and celestial? Wherefore speaks he this to her he hates? And wherefore doth Lysander deny your love so rich within his soul, and tender me, forsooth, affection, but by your setting on, by your consent? What thou I be not so in grace as you, so hung upon with love, so fortunate, but miserable most, to love unloved? This you should pity rather than despise. I understand not what you mean by this. I do. Persevere, counterfeit sad looks, make mouths upon me when I turn my back, wink each at other, hold the sweet jest up. This sport well carried shall be chronicled. If you have any pity, grace, or manners, you would not make me such an argument. But fare you well. Tis partly my own fault, which death or absence shall soon remedy. Stay, gentle Helena, hear my excuse. My love, my life, my soul, fair Helena. Oh, excellent. Sweet, do not scorn her so. If she cannot entreat, I can compel. Thou canst compel no more than she entreat. Thy, treat, thy threats have no more strength than her weak prayers. Helen, I love thee, by my life I do. I swear by that which I will lose for thee, to prove him false that says I love thee not. I say I love thee more than he can do. If thou say so, withdraw and prove it too. Quick, come. Lysander, where to tends all this? Away, you parasite. No, no, sir, yield. Seem to break loose, take on as you would follow, but yet, yet come not, you are a tame man, go. Hang off, thou cat, thou burr, vile thing, let loose, or I will shake thee from me like a serpent. Why are you grown so rude? What changes this, sweet love? Thy love? Out, tarny tartar, out! Out, loathed medicine, ow, hey, oh, hey, oh, hated potion hence. Do you not jest? Yes, sooth, and so do you. Demetrius, I will keep my word with thee. I would I had your bond, for I perceive a weak bond holds you. I'll trust not your word. What, should I hurt her, strike her, kill her dead? Although I hate her, I'll not harm her so. What can you do me greater harm than hate? Hate me, wherefore, oh me, what news, my love? Am not I Hermia, or not you Lysander? I am as fair now as I was erewhile. Since night you loved me, yet since night you left me. Why then you left me, oh, the gods forbid, in earnest, shall I say? Hey, by my life, and never did desire to see thee more. Therefore be out of hope, of question, of doubt. Be certain, nothing truer. Tis no jest that I do hate thee and love Helena. Oh, me, you juggler, you canker blossom, you thief of love. What, have you come by night and stolen my love's heart from him? Fine, I faith. Have you no modesty, no maiden shame, no touch of bashfulness? What, will you tear impatient answers from my gentle tongue? Fie, fie, you counterfeit, you puppet, you. Puppet? <laughs> Why so? I that way goes the game. Now I perceive that she hath made compare between our statures. She hath urged her height, and with her personage, her tall personage, her height, forsooth she hath prevailed with him. And are you grown so high in his esteem because I am so dwarfish and so low? How low am I, thou painted maypole? Speak, how low am I? I am not yet so low, but that my nails can reach unto thine eyes. 
I pray you, though you mock me, gentlemen, let her not hurt me. I was never cursed. Let her not strike me. You perhaps may think because she is something lower than myself that I can match her. Lower? Hark again. Good Hermia, do not be so bitter with me. I evermore did love you, Hermia. Did ever keep your counsels, never wronged you, save that in love unto Demetrius. I told him of your stealth unto this wood. He followed you for love, I followed him. But he hath chided me hence and threatened me to strike me, spurn me, nay, to kill me too. And now, so you will let me quite go to Athens, will I bear my folly back and follow you no further. Let me go. You see how simple and how fond I am. Why get you gone? Who is that hinders you? A foolish heart that I leave here behind. What, with Lysander? With Demetrius. Be not afraid. She shall not harm thee, Helena. No, sir, she shall not, though you take her part. Oh, when she is angry, she is keen and shrewd. She was a vixen when she went to school, and though she be but little, she is fierce. Little? Again, nothing but low and little. Why will you suffer her to flout me thus? Let me come to her. Get gone, you dwarf, you minimus hindering not grass maid, you bead, you acorn. You are too officious in her behalf that scorns your services. Let her alone, speak not of Helena. Take not her part. For if thou dost intend never so little show of love to her, thou shalt abide it. Now she holds me not. Now follow, if thou darst to try whose right of thine or mine is most in Helena. <laughs> follow? Nay, I'll go with thee cheek by jowl. Demetrius and Lysander exit, Oberon enters. You, mistress, all this toil is long with you. Nay, go not back. I will not trust you. I no longer stay in your cursed company. Your hands than mine are quicker for a fray. My legs are longer, though, to run away. I'm amazed and know not what to say. Elena and Hermia exit. This is thy negligence. Still thou makest or else commits thy knaveries willfully. Believe me, King of Shadows, I mistook. Did you not tell me I should know the man by the Athenian garments he had on? And so far blameless proves my enterprise that I have anointed an Athenian's eyes. <laughs> and so far am I glad it did so sort as this their jangling, I esteem a sport. Thou seest these lovers seek a place to fight. Hey, hi therefore, Robin, overcast the night, the starry welkin cover thou anon with drooping fog as black as Acheron, and lead these testy rivals so astray as one come not within another's way, and from each other look thou lead them thus till over their brow death counterfeiting sleep with laden legs and batty wings doth creep. Then Crush this herb into Lysander's eye, whose liquor hath this virtuous property, to take from hence all error with this might, and make his eyeball roll with wanted sight. And when they next wake, all this derision shall seem a dream and fruitless vision, and back to Athens shall the lovers wend with league, whose date till death shall never end. Whilst I, in this affair, do thee employ, I'll go to my queen and beg her Indian boy, and then I will her charmed eye release from monster's view, and all things shall be peace. My fairy lord, this, this must be done with haste, for night's swift dragons cut the clouds full fast, and yonder shines Aurora's harbinger, at whose approach ghosts wandering here and there troop home to churchyards. Oh, Puck, but we are spirits of another sort, I with the morning's love have oft made sport, and like a forester the groves may tread, even till the eastern gate all fiery red, opening to Neptune with fair blessed beams turns into yellow gold his salt green streams. But notwithstanding, haste, make no delay. We may effect this business yet ere day. Yeah, exit. I'm going to go ahead and call intermission at this point. Um, so I am, this is me jumping in and letting our actors take five. Um, in the meantime, uh, I will, I'm going to take a break for a quick second to grab something to drink. 
but then I'm going to guide you all, all our viewers who are wonderful. There's so many of you. Gosh. Um, I'm going to guide you how to make a donation. I ask that everyone, you know, if you can, give $1, give 5 give 20 whatever you can. But I'll be back to guide you through that. If you're an independent viewer that can figure out on your own actingforacause.org, do it now. I'll be back. Ah, there we go. I'm back. Oh my goodness. I'm going to miss this so badly. I think I'm going to, I'm going to plan another one of these. I said this was going to be the last one, but I'm going to have to plan more. Oh, what is my team going to think? <laughs> no, I, I don't know yet. I don't know yet. Um, a lot of people have been asking. I'm going to go on live on Instagram too while I'm talking and doing this. So um, once this is done, checking connection, I'll continue to talk. A lot of people are asking what's next. Um, so my dream is to create the first, I don't know if it's the first first, but perhaps the first nonprofit film production company. Um, so those who are curious about what my future is, if everything happens according to plan, that is a dream, that is a dream. Um, so now that we have, I'm gonna go ahead and take over this view. I don't know why I have everyone on, there we go. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna go on actingforacause.org. Let me minimize all my crazy tabs here. Um, minimize scripts, minimize Zoom, minimize email. Okay, and now I'm going to, what am I doing here? Um, what did I just do? Here we go. Um, screen share, desktop, and now full screen, and there we go. I'm going to go to actingforcause.org and we get to this wonderful welcome screen, which is different on your phones, um, but on your phones you can find the menu, it literally says menu, and uh, you click on donate now. We're Instagram viewers, what are you doing? You have to come back and watch our show. Click the link in my bio. Um, you guys are amazing. Hey, hey everyone. All right. Um, <laughs> we are on the EIS website now. By clicking donate now, it takes us to a specific link uh, that, uh, uh, what is it? What is the word I'm looking for? It allows us to do that whole setup where half of it goes to the EIF and half of it goes to Mount Sinai. So this specific link, you go through actingforacause.org, it's the only place to get to it. And then you're gonna select the gift amount. And I'm going to give 10, 25, 35. I can actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go big. I'm doing 250 today. You don't have to do it, viewers, but please give at least one dollar. Do this with me, um, please, 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 pretty please. Um, but if you can give more, give more. Give 25. I've done 25. I've done 10 dollars at times. At times I'm broke and I give one dollar. Um, that's that's made up. But if you are broke, give one dollar. Just to because there's so much power in numbers. There's like what is it like 10,000 people? <laughs> um, let me see how many people have tuned in. 12,509 people. That's a lot of people. Um, and uh, 39 on my Instagram live. Hey guys, you guys rock. I love you all. Love you all. Um, 
Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and give 250. I'm gonna now not do my screen shares so that way I can put in my credit card number. Uh, what am I doing here? All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and do it and then I'm gonna show you guys proof that I did it because I am not the kind of guy to say something and then not do it. I'm about to donate to very important causes. Remember, this is going to families. And um, you know, I always, I, I like to spend money on fun stuff like donkey years every once in a while. But more importantly, um, I do like to make sure I give at least 10% of what I get, tax deductible too guys, to people who need it a lot more than me. And this is the final time, um, at least during the middle of a live stream, you guys can see this. And I'm gonna go on a screen share one more time so you can see what you get. In the end, you get this little pop-up that says, your gift means greater impact. And I love that because it does, it means greater impact. You get a little message from the president and CEO. You see how much you donated. If you scroll down further, you can see my credit card number and my address, which I will not share again, uh, which has happened to me in the past. <laughs> and you get an, a letter to your email, which you can give to your accountant if you have one, or if you do your own taxes. You know, it's helpful. If you're from abroad and you're doing a donation, I love you, love you, love you. You don't get the tax deduction, but that's not why we do it. We do it for impact. I'm gonna go off of live now and I'm going to stop my screen share and get everything ready for act two. Um, so let's see if I can I'm gonna do this. Is anyone else there, Julia? Hi. Julia, I love the Rolling Stones article about you. I know I told you this before, but oh my gosh. Anyone who, who knows Julia and knows this, like Julia, just what Gotham breakout artist you received this just this past year, right? Mm -hmm. That's crazy. We're we're working with you. We're we're getting to see your talent literally at the like forefront of your career. It's insane. Oh my gosh! And and you know people who were um, in past readings were going crazy. They were going mad. They were like all. I mean, really for for a bunch of you guys. Same with Tommy. I don't know if you're. He's, he's there, but yeah, there he is. <laughs> People freaked out about the casting, Tommy as Puck. And I've been chasing down Tommy, to be honest. I've been wanting Tommy for a while for one of these reads. Mm -hmm. And I'm so happy you came for the last one. Yeah. Yes, I, um, I am so overjoyed. And uh, Andrew um, actually played, I wanna say you played Oberon at one point in your career as an actor, is that correct? I did, yeah. I I, uh, I studied Shakespeare for a year in England, and we did that production. But I never got to really use that skill set again. So this was really exciting. Man, I am so lucky. He's another one who Andrew and I have been like chatting about this collaboration for a bit. Um, and I'm very happy to have you, man. Thank you. Um, and Pauline, oh my goodness, what a Pauline is in Paris or in near Paris or something along those lines. And, uh, and it's like, what, one in the morning? No, it's um, 12.21. Woo! That's commitment, that's commitment. I'm so impressed. I mean, I, I'm, I think that that's another one we were just talking about, Julia, like being at the forefront of her career. I'm like, Pauline, oh my God. Like if you, I, I wish we could be gifted with a, your career just being just every Shakespeare in the, the whole end. <laughs> I would love to do every Shakespeare. I'm, I, I would love to. Let's do it. I'm, I'm going to call you after this. Okay, <laughs> we're gonna that's after. fine. I'm flying to Paris tomorrow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're waiting on Lauren. We're pretty close to having the full cast back. Can we just do a page check really quick? Mm -hmm. Please, actually. I need that too. Good uh, night, Aaron. Thank you. Okay, so we were right at, I believe we were right at the end of Oberon's line. We may affect the business yet era day on the bottom of 37. Great, thank you. What I'd like to do is a little flashback. Oberon, if you could reread that little passage, just so we can remember. And uh, to viewers who are out there uh, who would like to follow along, so there's two amazing resources I'd like to mention. I didn't mention at the beginning because I was... A nervous mess as I usually am. This is closing night. I have like a middle school, like when I get into these plays, like I'm in my early 20s, but I turn into 13 year old middle school Brando excited about his play. <laughs> um, and I get very nervous. So there's two amazing resources for those of you who don't 
understand Shakespeare, go to No Fear Shakespeare, it's Sparknotes, um, and it translates the entire play into modern English for your enjoyment and understanding. And to be honest, uh, like yeah, Andrew- I'm a huge Shakespeare fan. And I have to say in high school, I did that the entire time. It just helped you understand. It's the best. It's literally, I mean, right. I, I'm sure I've, I've trained in Shakespeare too. And I have not had a better teacher than No Fear Shakespeare. And uh, I, um, I also will be posting a copy of the script afterwards. So if you want to go back and watch it again, as many of our viewers do, uh, according to our analytics, um, it'll be on actingforacause.org after this. I just have to put it on. Sorry. Um, and we have everyone now. I'm happy to see that. Uh, we are at the bottom of page 37 on our script. And we will go from Oberon's, but we are spirits of another sort. Uh, uh, but we are spirits of another sort. I, with the morning's love, have oft made sport, and like a forester, the groves may tread, even till the eastern gate, all fiery red, opening to Neptune with fair blessed beams, turns into yellow gold his salt green streams. But notwithstanding, haste, make no delay, we may affect this business yet ere day. Up and down, up and down, I will lead them up and down. I am feared in field and town, goblin lead them up and down. Where art thou, proud Demetrius? Speak thou now. Here, villain, drawn and ready. Where art thou? I will be with thee straight. Follow me then, to plainer ground. By Sander, speak again, thou runaway, thy coward, art thou fled? Speak, in some bush, where dost thou hide thy head? Thou coward, art thou bragging to the stars? Telling the bushes that thou look'st for wars and wilt not come. Come, recrent, come thou child, I'll whip thee with a rod. He is defiled that draws a sword on thee. Yea, art thou there? Follow my voice, we'll try no manhood here. He goes before me and still dares me on. When I come where he calls, then he is gone. The villain is much lighter healed than I. I followed fast, but faster did he fly. Uh, that fallen am I in dark and un uneven way, and here will rest me. Come, thou gentle day, for if but once thou show me thy gray light, I'll find Demetrius and revenge this spite. Ho, 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 coward, why comest thou not? Abide me if thou darest, for well I wot, thou runnest before me, shifting every place, and darest not stand nor look me in the face. Where art thou now? I'm hither, I am here. Nay then, thou mockest me. Thou shalt buy this dear, if I ever thy face by daylight see. Now go thy way. A faintness constraineth me to measure out my length on this cold bed. My day's approach look to be visited. Mm -hmm. Oh, weary night. O long and tedious night, abate thy hours. Shine comforts from the east, that I may back to Athens by daylight from these that my poor company detest. And sleep, that sometimes shuts up sorrow's eyes, steal me away from thine mine own company. Chapter three, come one more. Two of both kinds makes up four. She always cursed and sad. She but is a navish lad thus to make poor females mad. Never so weary, never so in woe. Be dabbled with the dew and torn with briars. I can no further crawl, no further go. My legs can keep no pace with my desires. Here will I rest me till the break of day. Heavens shield Lysander if they mean a fray. On the bones of sound. I'll apply to your eye, gentle lover, remedy. When thou wakes, thou takes true delight in the sight of my former lady's eye. In the country proverb known that every man should take his own, and your waking shall be known. Jack shall have Jill, not shall go ill. The man shall have his mare again, and all shall be well. Enter Titiana, Queen of Fairies. 
Bottom the clown, fairies, cobwebs, pea blossom, moss, musty seed, and King Oberon behind them. Come, um, sit thee down upon this flowery bed. While I thy amiable cheeks do coy and stick musk roses in thy sleek smooth head and kiss thy fair large ears, my gentle joy. <sighs> Where's Peace Blossom? Ready. Scratch my head, Peace Blossom. Where's Monsieur Cobweb? Ready. Monsieur Cobweb, good monsieur. Get your weapons in your hand and kill me a red-ribbed humblebee on top of a thristle. And good monsieur, bring me the honey bag. Do not fret yourself to, to do too much action. Monsieur and good monsieur, have a care the honey bag break not. I would be loath to have you overflowing with a honey bag, senor. Where's Monsieur Mustard Seed? Ready. Give me your knife, Monsieur Mustard Seed. Pray you, leave your curtsy, good Monsieur. What's your will? Nothing, good Monsieur. But to help cavalry, peace blossom, to scratch. I must to the barbers, Monsieur. For me thinks I am marvelous hairy about the face, and I am such a tender ass. If my hair do but tickle me, ah, I must scratch. Or say, sweet love, what thou desirest to eat. Truly a peck of provender. I could much your good dry oats. Me thinks I have a great desire to a bottle of hay. Good hay, sweet hay. Half no fellow. I have a venturous fairy that shall seek the squirrel's board and fetch thee new nuts. Well, I had rather have a handful or two of dried peas. But pray you, let none of your people stir me. I have exposition of sleep come upon me. Sleep thou, and I will wind thee in my arms. Fairies, be gone, and be always away. So doth the woodbine, the sweet honeysuckle, gently entwist the female ivy, so enrings the barky fingers of the elm. Oh, how I love thee, how I dote on thee. <sighs> it's late. Seest thou sweet sight, her dotage, now I do begin to pity for meeting her of late behind the wood, seeking sweet favors for this hateful fool. I did upbraid her and fall out with her when I had at my pleasure taunted her, and she in mild terms begged my patience. I then did ask for her changeling child, which straight she gave me, and her fairy sent to bear him to my bower in fairyland. Now I have the boy. I will undo this hateful imperfection of her eyes. Puck. Gentle Puck, take this transformed scalp from off the head of this Athenian swain, that he awakening when the other do may all to Athens back again repair and think no more of this night's accidents but as the fierce vexation of a dream. But first I will release the fairy queen. Be as thou wast wont to be, see as thou wast wont to see. Diane's bud over Cupid's flower hath such force and blessed power. Now, Titania, wake you, my sweet queen. Oh, my Oberon, what visions have I seen? Methought I was enamored of an ass. <laughs> there lies your love. How, how came these things to pass? Oh, how, how mine eyes do loathe his visage now. Silence a while. Robin, take off his head. Now when thou wakest with thine own fool's eyes. Beep. Boop. Now thy, thou and I are in new amity, and will tomorrow midnight solemnly dance in Duke's Theseus' house triumphantly, and bless it to all fair prosperity. There shall be the pairs of faithful lovers be wedded with Theseus all in jollity. Very kind, attendant Mark. I do hear the morning lark. Then, my queen, in silence, sad, trip we after night's shade. We the globe can compass soon, swifter than the wandering moon. 
Oh, my Lord, and in our flight, tell me how it came this night that I sleeping here was found with these mortals on the ground. They exit. Enter Theseus, Hippolyta, and Aegeus. We will, fair queen, up to the mountain's top and mark the musical's confusion of hounds and echo in conjunction. But soft, what nymphs are these? My lord, this is my daughter here asleep. And this Lysander, this Demetrius is. This is Helena. Old Neaters, Helena. I wonder if they're being here together. No doubt they rose up early to observe the rite of May, and hearing our intent came here in grace of our solemnity. But speak, Aegeus, is not this the day that Ermia should give her answer of her choice? It is, my lord. The love is awake. <clears throat> Good morrow, friends. St. Valentine is past. Begin these woods, birds, but to couple now. Pardon, my lord. They kneel. I pray you. I'll stand up, stand up. I know you two are rival enemies. How comes this gentle concord in the world that hatred is so far from jealousy to sleepy by hate and fear no enmity? My lord, I shall reply amazedly. Half sleep, half waking, but as yet I swear I cannot truly say how I came here. But as I think for truly what I speak, and now I do bethink me, so it is, I came with Hermia hither. Our intent was to be gone from Athens where we might, without the peril of Athenian law. Enough, enough, my lord, you have enough. I beg the law, the law upon his head. They would have stolen away, they would, Demetrius. Thereby, to have defeated you and me, you of your wife, and of me, of my consent, of my consent that she should be your wife. My lord, fair Helen told me of their stealth, of this purpose hither to the, this wood, and I, in theory, hither followed them. Fair Helena, in fancy, following me. But, my good lord, I what not by what power, but by some power it is, my love to Hermia melted as the snow seems to me now as the remembrance of an, an idol god which in my childhood I did dote upon, and all the faith, the, vir the virtue of my heart, the object and the pleasure of mine eye is only Helena. To her, my lord, was I betrothed ere I saw Hermia, but like a sickness did I loathe this food. But as in health come to my natural taste, now I do wish for it, love it long for it, and will forevermore be true to it. <laughs> fair lovers, you are fortunately met of this fair discourse. We more will hear anon. Aegeus, I will overbear your will. For in the temple, by and by, with us, these couples shall eternally be knit. And for the morning now is something worn. Our proposed hunting shall me set aside. Away with us to Athens, three and three will hold a feast in great solemnity. Come, Hippolyta. Exit Theseus, Hippolyta, and Aegeus. Ah, oh, these things seem small and undistinguishable, like far off mountains turned into clouds. Methinks I see these things with parted eye when everything seems double. Are you sure that we are awake? It seems to me that yet we sleep, we dream. Do not you think the Duke was here and, and bid us follow him? Yea. And Hippolyta. And he did bid us follow to the temple. Why then, we are awake. Let's follow him. And by the way, let us recount our dreams. They exit, bottom wake. <sighs> When Mike, you comes, call me and I will answer. My next is most fair Pyramus. Hey ho, Peter Quinn's flute, the bellows mender, snout, the tinkerer, starveling. God's my life stolen hence and left me asleep. Wow. I had. A most rare vision. I have had a dream past the wit of man 
to say what dream it was. <clears throat> Man is but an ass if you go about to expound this dream. Methought I what? Man hath not seen. But man is a patched fool if he offer to say what me thought I had. The eye of man hath not heard. The ear of man hath not seen. Man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what my dream was. I will get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream, and it shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it hath no bottom. And I will sing it in the latter end of our play before the Duke, peradventure to make it more gracious. I will sing it at her death. Bottom exit. Enter Quince, Flute, Snout, and Starveling. Have you sent to Bottom's house? Has he come home yet? He cannot be heard of. Out of doubt he is transported. If he come not, then the play is marred. It goes not forward, does it? It is not possible. You have not a man in all Athens able to discharge Pyramus, but he... No, he hath simply the best wit of any handicraft man in Hampton. Yea, and the best person, too. And he is a very paramour for a sweet voice. You must say paragon. A paramour is, God bless us, a thing of naught. Enter snug. Masters, the duke is coming from the temple, and there is two or three lords and ladies more married. If our sport has gone forward, we had all be made men. We, we, we all be made men. Oh, sweet bully bottom. Thus, hath he lost six pence a day during his life? He cannot have escaped a six pence a day, and the duke had not given him six pence a day for playing Pyramus. I'll be hanged. He would have deserved it. Six pence a day in Pyramus, or nothing. Enter bottom. Where are the lads? <clears throat> Where are these hearts? Bottom, a oh, most courageous day, a most happy hour. Masters, I am to discourse wonders, but ask me not what. For if I tell you I am not a true Athenian, I will tell you everything right as it fell out. Let us hear, sweet Bottom. <sighs> not a word of me. All that I will tell you is that the duke hath dines. Get your apparel together, good strings to your beards, new ribbons to your pumps. Meet presently at the palace. Every man look o'er his part, for the short and the long is our play is preferred. <laughs> and most dear actors eat no gun onions nor garlic, for we are to utter sweet breath. And I do not doubt but to hear them say it is a sweet comedy. No more words. Away. Go away! Enter Philistrate, Hippolyta, and Theseus. Strange, my Theseus, that these lovers speak of. More strange than true, I, I never may believe these antique fables, nor these fairy toys. You know, lovers and madmen have such seething brains, such shaping fantasies that apprehend more than full reason of what comprehends. But all the story of the night told over, and all their minds transfigured so together, more witnesseth than fancies images, and grows to something of great constancy. But howsoever strange and admirable. And say lovers. Lysander, Demetrius, Hermia, and Helena. Ah, here come the lovers, full of joy and mirth. Joy, gentle friends, joy and fresh days of love. Accompany your hearts. More than to us, wait in your royal box, your board, your bed. Come now, what masks, what dances shall we have to wear away this long age of three hours between the after supper and bedtime? Is there no play to ease the anguish of a torturing hour? Uh, call Philistrate. Uh, here, mighty thesis. Say, what abridgment have you for this evening? Uh, a play there is, my lord, some ten words long, which is as brief of, as I have known a play, but by ten words, my lord, it is, it is too long. 
which makes it tedious. For in all the play, there is not one word apt, one player fitted. Hmm. What are they that do play it? Hard-handed men that work in Athens here, which never labored in their minds till now, and now have toiled their unbreathed memories with this same play against your nuptial. And we will hear it. No, my noble lord, it is not for you. I have heard it over, and it is nothing. Nothing in the world. Unless you can find sport in their intents, extremely stretched and conned with cruel pain to do you service. I will hear that play, for never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it. Go, bring them in, and take your places, ladies. I quit for the straight. I love not to see wretchedness overcharged and duty in his service perishing. Why, gentle sweet, you shall see no such thing. He says they can do nothing in the kind. The kind are we to give them thanks of nothing. Enter Philistrate. <clears throat> so please, your grace, the prologue is addressed. Let him approach. Enter the prologue. If we offend, it is with our good will. And you should think we come not to offend, but with good will. To show our simple skill, that is the true beginning of our end. Consider then, we come but in despite. We do not come as minding to content you, our true intent is. All for your delight, we are not here. But you should here repent you, the actors are at hand. And by their show, you shall know all that you are like to know. This fellow doth not stand upon points. He hath writ his prologue, prologue like a rough colt. He knows not the stop. A good moral, my lord, is not, to, uh, not enough to speak, but to speak true. Indeed, he hath played on this prologue like a child on a recorder. A sound, but not in government. His speech was like a tangled chain, nothing impaired, but all disordered. Who is next? Enter Pyramus and Thisbe, and Wall, and Moonshine, and Lion. Gentles. Perchance you wonder at this show, but wonder on till truth make all things clear. This man. Your handsome man. Handsome man is Pyramus, if you would know. This beauteous lady, Thisbe is certain. This man with lime and rough cast doth present wall. That vile wall which did these lovers sunder. And through walls chink, poor souls, they are content to whisper. At the which let no man wonder. This man with lantern, dog, and bush of thorn presenteth moonshine. For, if you will know, by moonshine did these lovers think no scorn to meet at Ninus' tomb there, there to woo. This grisly beast, which lion hight by name, <coughs> the trusty Thisbe, coming first by night, did scare away, or rather did affright. And as she fled, her mantle she did fall, which lion vile with bloody mouth did stain. Anon comes Pyramus, sweet youth and tall, and finds his trusty Thisbe's mantle slain. Whereat, with blade, with bloody lameful blade, he bravely broached his boiling bloody breast, and Thisbe, tarrying in mulberry shade, his dagger drew and died. For all the rest, let lion, moonshine, wall, and lovers twain at large discourse while here they do remain. I wonder if the lion be to speak. <laughs> no wonder, my lord. One lion may when many asses do. <laughs> Are the wall and moonshine to speak as well? If they be such asses as the rest. <clears throat> In this interlude doth befall that I, one snout by name, present a wall, and such a wall as I would have you think that had a crannied hole or chink through which the lovers Pyramus and Thisbe did whisper often very secretly. This loam, this rough cast, and this stone doth show that I am the same wall, the truth is show. And this cranny is bright and sinister, through which fearful lovers are to whisper. Would you desire lime and hair to speak better? <laughs> It is the wittiest partition that ever I heard discourse, my lord. What a shame it is to look upon such vileness of authority. 
Lysander. He's the stars and the moon wrapped in magical. Pyramus draws near the wall, silence. <clears throat> oh, grim looked night! Oh, night with hue so black. O oh, night, which ever art, when day is not. I fear my Thisbe's promise is forgotten. Thou, O oh, wall, O oh, sweet, O oh, lovely wall, that stands between her father's ground and mine. Show me thy chink to blink through with mine eye. Thanks, courteous wall. Jove, shield thee well for this, but what see I? No Thisbe do I see. O oh, wicked wall! <laughs> Thou whom I see no bliss, cursed be thy stones for deceiving me. The wall, methinks, being sensible, should curse again. N no, um, in truth, sir, he should not. Uh, deceiving me is Thisbe's cue. She is to enter now. And I am to spy her through the wall. You see, it will fall pat as I told you. Yonder she comes. O oh, wall, full often hast thou heard my moans for parting my fair pyramus and me. My cherry lips have often kissed thy stones, thy stones with lime and hair knit up in thee. The wall doth need a good shower of hair be caught up everywhere. I see a voice. Now will I to the chink to spy, and I can hear Thisbe's face. Thisbe. My love, thou art my love, I think. Think what thou wilt. I am thy lover's grace, and like Limander am trusty still. And I, like Helen, to the fates me kill. Not Shafulus to Procrus was so true. As Shafulus to Procrus, I to you. Oh, kiss me through this hall of this vile wall. Hark, these kids and the gross affection they share continue to the line already. No, no, no. Let them continue. This is a wedding celebration after all. I kiss the walls whole, not your lips at all. Wilt thou at Ninny's tomb meet me straight away? Tide life, tide death, I come without delay. And thus have I wall my part discharged so, and being done thus wall away doth go. Now is the mural down between the two neighbors? Uh, no remedy, my lord, when walls are so willful to hear without warning. This is the still silliest stuff I've ever heard. Best in this are but shadows, and the worst are no worse if imagination and mend them. It must be your imagination then, and not theirs. If we imagine no worse of them than they themselves, they may pass for excellent men. Here come two noble beasts in a man and a lion. You, ladies who gentle hearts do fear, the smallest monstrous mounts that creeps on floor. May now perchance both quake and tremble here when lion wrath in wildest rage doth roar. Let us hear him roar. Roar! Oh, that was piteous. He must be able to do more. Let him roar again. Let him roar again. Roar! Oh, yikes. He thinks that roar be too frightening for the ladies of the crowd. Nay, thou art worried for naught. We are stronger than thou thinks. Roar thou loudest, lion. Watch thy tongue on such immediate matters. Ah, oh, simply not. I ask you, sir, to watch your tongue. I shall not be placed in a land of silly fantasy. I would rather fight amongst the mighty crowd and hear the joy of men roar. I, I, that, that's enough. Indeed, twas enough two turns prior. And no, I am as smug the joiner. I'm a lion's cell, nor else no lion's den. A very gentle beast and of a good conscience. 
<laughs> the very best at a beast, my lord, that I e'er saw. <laughs> this lion is very good fox for his valor. True, and a goose for his discretion. Well, not so, my lord, for his valor cannot carry his discretion. And the fox carries the goose. His discretion, I am sure, cannot carry his valor, for the goose carries the not the fox, it is well. Leave it to his discretion and let us listen to the moon. This lantern doth the horned moon present. He should have worn the horns on his head. Yes. He, he is no crescent and his horns are invisible within the circumference. Myself, the man in the moon do seem to be. No, no, no. This is the greatest error of all the rest. The man should be put into the lantern. How else is he the man in the moon? Well, he dares not come there for the candle, for you see it is already in snuff. I am wary of this moon. What he would change. It appears by his small light of discretion that he is in the wane, but yet in courtesy and all reason, we, we must stay the time. <sighs> Proceed, moon, though I care not to listen. I sit with pride and hope that though will soon end this speech of utter boredom. All I have to say is to tell you that the lantern is the moon, I the man in the moon, this thorn bush, my thorn bush, and this dog, my dog. Why, all these should be in the lantern, for all these are in the moon. Oh, but silence, here comes Pyramus. <coughs> Sweet moon, I thank thee for thy sunny beams, for by thy... Your entrance has come yet before your love's death, dumbass! Oh, oh um, uh, well, well, um, now will I, 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 I will, I, I will find a flower to give to my love in the hour. Uh, we take you back minutes ago before Pyramus came into this tomb. This is old Ninny's tomb. Where is my love? Oh. Well, roar, lion. Better than he hath done before. Well run, Fisby. Well shown, moon. Truly, the moon shines with a good grace. Well moused, lion. Well moused. And then came Pyramus. And so the lion vanished as to provide brave Pyramus with nothing left to laugh at. <clears throat> Sweet moon, I thank thee for thy sunny beams. For by thy gracious golden glittering gleams, I trust to take of truest Thisbe sight. But stay, O oh spite, what dreadful droll is here? Eyes, do you see? How can it be? How can it be, O oh dainty duck, O oh dear, thy mantle good? What stained with blood? blood? O oh, fates, come, come, cut them and thrum, quail, crush, conclude, and quell. This passion and the death of a dear friend would go near to make a man look sad. Be true, my heart, but I pity the man. I have pitied them all since they first began. Ah, can thou see the sadness I feel? My tears in voice doth show that. I, we, we hearest thou. Now continue on to see what happens next. Oh, uh, oh, wherefore nature did thou lions frame, since lion vile hath have deflowered my dear, which is, no, no, uh, which was thy thy fairest dame, that lived, that loved, that liked, that looked with cheer. <laughs> Come tears confound out sword wound. The path of Pyramus. That doth do nothing but bring pain. His right side hath nothing to harm. Oh, and that left path, boom, where heart doth hop. Thus die I, thus 
Thus, thus, thus. Now I am dead. Now I am fled. My soul is in the sky. Now die, die, die! No die, but an ace for him. For he is but one. Oh, less than an ace, man, for he is dead. He is nothing. With the help of a surgeon, he might yet recover and prove an ass. He might even become so brilliant that the women fondle on him as vines to the brick wall. However, he needs much polishing to become such a man. How chance Moonshine is gone before this becomes back and finds her lover? You will find him by starlight. Oh, here she comes, and her passion ends the play. If either her drowning and such vile false play to the script could make my eyes burn any further. Methinks she should not use a long one for such as Pyramus. I hope she will be brief. No matter dramatics or comedy, she cannot bring any substance to the rest of this artistic journey. Hopefully her tears will end this, and we may leave the sadness of acting that lies ahead. Indeed, I cannot stand soliloquies. Their lengthy nature doth bore me. A moat will turn the balance, which Pyramus, which Thisbe is the better. He for a man, God warrant us. She for a woman, God bless us. She hath spied on him already with those sweet eyes. And thus she means <laughs> Videlis it. <laughs> Pardon, lords, but we are in the midst of a performance. Couldst thou take thy conversing to the lobby? Ah, oh, a thousand apologies. Continue on. Okay. Superb. And thus, I've died. Asleep, my love. What? Dead, my dove. O oh, Pyramus, arise. Speak, speak quite dumb. I, my love, I wish I could to kiss thee again. Alas, my lungs hath sprung a leak, thus I can speak no more. And again I die. That man doth not know when to quit. He should stop while he's ahead and not linger on this death. Aye, I agree, father. That man overacts horribly. He should never act again. A sentiment I'd hold to all of these players, save the lion, perhaps. Why did we ever come and see such a horrific display? No continence, no manners, and simply not accomplished for their ages. Disgraceful in the lightest sense. Dead. Dead. A tomb must cover thy sweet eyes. His eyes were green as leeks. O oh, sister thee, come, come to me. Tongue not a word. Come trusty sword, come blade, my breast and brew, and farewell friends. Thus this be ends. Adieu, adieu, adieu. Oh, moonshine and lion are left to bury the dead. Hey, and wall too. No, I assure you. The wall is down that parted their fathers. Will it please you to see the epilogue or to hear a barrack mask dance between the two of our company? No, 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 no epilogue, I pray you, for your play needs no excuse. <laughs> Never excuse for when the players are all dead. There need none to be blamed. L let your epilogue alone. Lovers, to bed, tis almost fairy time. I fear we shall outsleep the coming morn as such as we this night have overwatched. This palpable Gross play hath well beguiled the heavy gate of night. Sweet friends, to bed, a fortnight hold we the solemnity in nightly revels and new jollity. Shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended. That you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear. And this weak and idle theme, no more yielding but a dream, gentles <laughs> do not reprehend. If you pardon, we will mend, and as I, I'm an honest hawk. If we have unearned luck now to scrape the serpent's tongue, we will make amends ere long, else the puck a liar call. So, oh, good night unto you all. In mere hands, if we be friends, and Robin shall restore. Amen.
And thus ends A Midsummer Night's Dream and the final reading, planned reading at least, for Acting for a Cause's live read series during the quarantine. I thank you all, these actors. Oh my dear Lord, this was such a great cast. Um, I implore everyone who is watching right now, if everyone who's watching gave $20, we would have another $10,000 in donations. Please go to actingforacause.org and do it. If not for me, for all these beautiful people on the screen right now. And with that, a sincere thank you to our audience for being so trusty, so wonderful, uh, like a spaniel. <laughs> um, so, so wonderful uh, for being in this uh, with us. Blessings to everyone who watches this now, live or later. And, uh, and thank you once again on behalf of all of us. Thank you.